Hello, it is the 9th of July. I'm Shane Greenup. This is my daily vlog thing. Um, so it's Monday. It's actually afternoon now, so I'm doing this a bit late. And um, I'm just going to start with crypto stuff because um, I spend most of the morning doing is trying to sort of assess the situation a bit. <coughs> so over the weekend, we've had another pump up to a new high, but um. I feel like we are losing steam with each of these pumps. They're getting less and less um, impressive. We're approaching this um, high, which I've whipped off on the basis that we had these two spikes hit that price, which is short. <coughs> In the previous video uh, I watched recently, talked about how the price gets drawn towards these um, points of liquidity. It's like, um, you know, they stopped there because someone was selling at that price quite a bit. And um, implied that this happens quite a lot. That um, when you have a sort of like double tap like that, then eventually the price will go back to that point and break through. It's like break through that to get um, all of the liquidity there, which I guess is related to the Wyckoff sort of principle. It's like so someone that's bought down around the bottom here, um, they know that there are people selling at this price, so they'll buy and they'll just wait for it to get there um no, so i'm doing it back to front um people are selling there then they know that that's a place that they can accumulate so basically so yeah so they'll be accumulating the whole way up here um slowly letting each of the dips and then getting up here they know that there's enough volume here that they can buy a lot at that level and then if it dips through, then they can just sort of wait because they, they've provided all of this up momentum. They can wait for it to come back down after that on its own steam because they've stopped providing the um, buying pressure. So the price should fall back down. So in a, a large institutional accumulation sort of style, they can um, use this these points of liquidity uh, knowing that they can, you know, get a lot of coins there and then similarly if there's another one down here we've got these two bottoms then you can perhaps expect and i've got a line there All right so actually just from this one but on a smaller time scale you probably see there'll be two um, so well okay it's going off this one of that and then that's a bit short of it so either way you know there's a lot of buying pressure there so if someone wants to to sell they know they'll be able to sell quite a bit of volume at this point anyway um i'm probably not understanding that very thoroughly but it was just an interesting video that i saw that has um, made me just start tracking these uh, points of liquidity effectively so that's one thing is i've got that line there we haven't hit it yet um but generally the the kind of the trend that might happen is that we touch it and then go a little bit north of it um, and that takes up all the liquidity it's like it's, it's used all up so i'm waiting for that to happen um and another reason to wait for that to happen is um that there is this channel so another video i watched trade devils bearish channel showing we've got this clear um so let's get for a square tangle this trading channel that's here, like that. And there's a, mid a midline here, so it sort of like goes down, bounces up the midline, and it trades between this channel, breaks through the midline, goes down to this one, and trades in that channel, and breaks through, and sits on the midline, and makes its way up. But apparently, in the end, in the other video, um, so this is another one here, and another one here. So whenever we get these trading channels that really sit in these ranges for a long period of time, particularly when they have a midline and they sort of bounce upper end and lower end, upper end. Basically, what's going to happen, can happen, this frequently happens, is, is it will hit the top again and then not have any conviction or any um, momentum, and so it will fail. And when it does that, it will plummet straight through the bottom of this. So this one, it's like bottom, top. It's, you know, this sets the top there, goes through, sits on the halfway line, breaks the halfway, go down the bottom. Hits the bottom, okay, goes back up. Breaks through, we're in the top half, and, uh, break on. 
And now we're here, we hit the top, didn't make it, hit the top, didn't make it. If we're not going up, we're going down. And so then that's when it finally breaks through the bottom of it and um, and does it, does its thing. So this one, it's a trading range thing, and half there, one there, and went up. Why would it go up instead of down? I don't think this is a good way of necessarily indicating which direction it's going to go. Anyway, um, so I'm basically what I'm doing is I've, I've already opened up a reasonably strong short on Ethereum Classic, um, just in case it drops from here. And maybe that was effectively the, the top of the range, and now it's just like about to fail. Um, if it goes up, I'm going to wait for it to sort of break through, and then I'll add to my Ethereum Classic short <coughs> um, with a pretty tight stop loss on that breakout. So I'll try and pick the top and have a stop loss short above it, um, which I'll have to watch in real time because I can't because I'm watching Bitcoin's movement to determine my trade on Ethereum Classic, which is tricky, but um, seems worth in this environment. It seems to have seems to be the way to go because Bitcoin is controlling everything still though I'm starting to get some ports breaking out in this in this sideways um, movement that we've had for the past couple of weeks have we really been down there that far? about a week what is this? Yeah, four weeks we've been in that and we've just opened up week yeah this is week nine of the downtrend which is currently on a one um, so yeah, while we've been in this sideways trend and as we've had some upward movement in Bitcoin, some of the alts have just taken that and gone, you know what, some shoot up. ETP has been one of the biggest, which is frustrating because I actually haven't opened long debts in ETP. It would be nice to have had that open, but put all my longs closed because of the, the coming downward movement, well, because of the, the, the downward trend. And I've got to stop betting against the trend until it's clearly reversed, otherwise I can risk losing everything. So, hence, we're in the situation of I am focusing on shorting the bounce um, to, to, to trade with the trend, um, because then if I'm wrong, I'll have stop losses, which won't make my shorts too big, but at the same time, my um, my holdings of coins will gain value, and so my equity to debt ratio will improve, and so things get better anyway. Um, and hopefully, at the right time or well enough in advance, I'll be able to reopen longs and fix the debt problem as well. So, I'm waiting for that. I trade the short. Um, now, the, oh, that's right, this is also um, there's a lovely white off chart. Give me one second and I'll show it to you. This one. Just going across. Someone shared this on Twitter. Um, and it goes down. Accumulation. There's a markup that goes up and then the distribution is so off. Um, and it fails, goes back down. Now it's that. And then someone's marked it on the the current graph means this is the bottom, the second bottom goes up, mark up, and then it's distribution and was expecting a failed rally and then the mark down. And this was when this was done, this is before the most recent jump up, so we're actually up we jumped up here somewhere. We had arguably a not failed rally, it sort of broke through, but not by much, and then it's come back down again, so we're sitting here or somewhere, six thousand seven hundred ish. I'm waiting for it to go even higher. Um, but again, only marginally. So you can sort of see this is like a you know, big spike, like a big spike, half of that if that falls down, less again falls down. Another one which was again about the same size as that. And so I'm expecting one more which will be even smaller than the last one before it really gives up the ghost. So, so that white cloth accumulation thing is another reason I think it's going to go down. Now, whether it goes down to new lows or just down to here, or maybe you know, this uh, golden pocket zone, and then bounces from there, that's to be decided. Um, I will hopefully have a very strong short position open, 
when it gets down there, maybe I'll claim half of it or something like that. And then um see how we go. But um it's very hard trading at the moment for me. I guess that's always hard, but it's frustrating because if we go down I can't open longs. If we go down I'm I'm at risk of being liquidated. Um I kind of need the market to go up to be able to do anything. But I'm not seeing a lot of confidence that it will go up. Um Say that, but I also, but then also look at this, and there is more downside. Only just that's pretty marginal, it's very helpful. Um, still trading in this pitchfork sort of thing, and it's been obeying that really quite nicely, being the bottom and going all the way to the top. Sitting on the midline now, bounced off that. Um, I wonder if we go up to that midline, that'd be sort of like a nice technical sort of pivot for it to do that. Just sort of have hit that and now move up, break through this liquidation uh, liquidity point, hit this midpoint, and then crash down. That'd be very beautiful. So, blah. <clears throat> but yeah, that's that's what I was thinking was. But on the weekly, the difficulty that I'm seeing with the expectation that we're going down more, it's not difficulty. It's giving too much credence to the TD mark, I guess. You know, this looks like such a bottom. But is it you know, is it a bottom for the next down? If it does that, if like we're like going to roll over. Actually we're at the beginning of the week, so if this if the four hour rolls over and falls down here, this eight could go into like a you know, sorry, we're on this one aren't we? Um, this could turn into a red very quickly. So I guess that's it's just funny that uh, what happened there? It could happen. What I'm getting at is, if it was a nine, to keep it as a nine, to Tone Vase's opinion is we're going to 5300 or 40, no, 4900, and he doesn't see this as a bottom and the overall trends down and all that sort of stuff. And I don't, yeah, don't know what he's, I don't know if he's right or not. I don't, I don't want to trade against his perspective too much. I think he overlooks the influence of alts on the overall market, and I'm actually trading in alts anyway. It's just the Bitcoin's dominating it, but the alts also create a feedback where you know, if they refuse to go lower, then that whole, actually props up Bitcoin's price for the same reason the Bitcoin drags their price down. So um, in this drop, the alts went so low, and like you look at so many of their charts, and you're like, there's just no way they can go lower. Um, I think I think this is one of the reasons why things like Neo bounced so hard after this bottom because it went it went below it broke through support and then broke through more support and went to a point where it's like hitting the support from way back in um, November and October and there's just not a lot of room left below it short of it dying and this is the thing Tone Base thinks that these are all junk pieces of crap and they're going to die so I think that clouds his judgment because if he's wrong on that and I think he is um, these coins are actually going to have their own um, supports which will then prop up big coins and stuff anyway so these, these bounce really quite hard and so if Bitcoin goes down to 5,000 know, is that going to drive this all the way down to, to 20 and 15 dollars um, can Neo really be dragged down on it? So I guess as, as people have pointed out, the more time you spend down here, the more reasonable that price looks, and that's part of the problem. So it's like really hung out here and really normalized. You know what? Neo is worth $30 to $40. Um, it's just that when it goes to $45 from $200, uh, 150 here, like that felt ridiculous, so it bounced back quite hard. And now it's normalized being under a hundred dollars. It's gone down now it's normalizing being 30 to 40. So maybe we'll go down to 50, 15. Doesn't feel like it, but the feelings aren't really the best um, indicator, are they? So so I'm struggling because I feel like we've hit a bottom. 
and I feel like there's not a lot of room beneath us to go down into. And yet I'm shorting. <laughs> I am shorting the bottom. And that's terrifying. At least I'm shorting off the, a bounce. Um, I feel so stupid to be shorting the bottom. I, I shorted it on the way down to but I didn't just open and short and let it ride, which would have been you know, the stronger move. Um, and I've got to get better at doing that, at letting the wind ride. And, and I did to some extent, but then you know, on these big bounces, it's like, well, I better take my profits before it bounces up higher. And so I keep taking the profits on these bounces, but when you've got a clear trend, the problem is it's up here, you don't have that, that trend isn't so obviously clear. Blah. This is, this is definitely a video that no one should watch, because I'm not good enough to be giving trading advice or teaching, and therefore no one's learning anything from this, this is just me ruminating. That's right, this is my modern form of a diary. So, um, I'm opening a strong short, trading against my prediction that we'll get up to this line, and we're up to this line, um, which is fine. That's maximum pain, because that's maximum uncertainty. So it could still happen, because we're still, um, this is the daily chart, this is made on the weekly chart. So anytime in the next six, seven days, if we get up there, and that could easily happen. There's nothing stopping that. Um, if that happens, then that's great. Um, I'll get stopped on my short here-ish, and then I'll wait for the trend, and I'll open up longs. I'll wait for it to to go there and break through that, and then I'll short that. Because so I have to keep preferencing the short. Because if I go up, I win. If it goes down, I lose. So if I short, then I'm at least hedging the loss. And at the moment, I can't be thinking about making money. I have to be thinking about preserving my stack. That has to be my priority, and I have to draw that in. I have to internalize that and memorize it because you know that's not how we think, and that's not what I want to do. I like, keep feeling like I'm missing out on profits. Like when ATP went up, I'm like, oh, I should have longed that. I should have been there. But if I had of and it had gone against me, I could have lost a lot of money. I have to be focusing on preserving money rather than um, trying to make more. Um, for now, anyway, until we, we break out of this clear bear market, um, slash, hopefully, you know, if this is the bottom, we're at 5,000 at the bottom, and we're not getting anything drastic between here and there, we might be in the um, sideways whack off accumulation distribution phase thing. This may happen for another few months, which sucks because then I've got like months of feeling like this of just uncertainty and doubt. I'm not sure what, what, which way it's going. Am I doing the right trades? Um, and particularly if, it's, if it trades at this level or lower, that I'm constantly um, unable to actually long the bottom because I haven't got the equity there to allow me to open up the long. So I'm just constantly walking on this tightrope of potential liquidation and inability to improve the situation. Which sucks. Which is why, again, I have to aggressively short each bounce to actually get, because that's the only place I can trade is on a bounce. It's up at place where I have equity, and um, that's the only way I can improve the situation as we go back down. So keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. Um, that's it, that's all there is to say. And uh, if I'm really lucky, we're going to go up, tap that line, double down on my short, and then it's going to crash down to 4,900, take profit, and um, not liquidate me, and then get like a sharp bounce back up to 8,000 pounds, and then up to 10,000, 12,000. That's it. Okay. Enough Bitcoin. Um, what has happened? Um, I haven't worked on this past couple of days. Okay, weekend, I've been spending time with Leonardo. Uh, what else was I doing? I looked through the Udemy course a little bit, the crowdfunding course. Um, and contacts. So I've been looking at the podcasting idea a bit. I've got Mike Hind um, has decreed to be on the first episode. I was considering um, 
Yeah, I was considering doing the first one by myself. And that's when they, and so Mike got back to me this morning, he was busy all the way to Sunday, and got an email to me, and I followed up, but he hasn't applied to that. I was hoping to um to do the call now, to, to do it two hours ago when he emailed me, but he hasn't got back to me from that, so I'm still just waiting for him to say, yep, let's talk now. And my find is um, the creator of the, the Disinformation Age podcast. Um, I haven't heard of him outside of that, but he made a podcast, and it's about actually bots on Twitter is the focus and how that's, you know, astroturfing political division and, and, and so forth. Um, so this guy, um, very active in Twitter, um, and clearly he's a journalist, journalist background and interested in space. And the reason I wanted him, I wanted Dwight from MissInfoCon first because they're about to run a MissInfoCon, he has an obvious call to the community. And, and um, Dwight's not available for a couple of weeks and I want to get this happening quicker than that. And Mike's um, an obvious second choice because of the same reason. He's this sort of um, generalist in the community. He's, you know, he's, he's looking at a lay of the land and what's happening and creating a podcast around it. So I want to have someone on who I can talk to generally and broadly about it as a, for a first episode rather than having someone, um, say, Drew Gilardi from Fact Marta, someone who's working on a specific thing, and then they talk about Fact Marta and Briefer. Um, I definitely want to have Drew on um, in a later episode. For a first episode, I thought the idea would be nice to have a generalist talking broadly about the misinformation problem, um, what needs to be done, what we're doing wrong, what we're doing right, and so forth. So, still hoping that he'll get back to me today and we'll do it today because I want to get this moving. I haven't done anything else on it. But I figure once I record the first episode, then I'll start um, rolling out all the other solutions I need, such as. Um, Converting it to audio, uh, finding out where I upload podcasts. I actually have to talk to Mike about that since he's got a podcast. He can tell me what he's found that works well. Um, but yeah, I always record it, upload it to YouTube, and then uh, start uploading a podcast thing. I just haven't got a name. I should find a name. I actually wanted the misinformation age, but Mike's is the disinformation age. Um, it can be partner podcasts. Um, but yeah, that. I figured I'll just put all that off until I am. Do I go away? That's friends, by the way. Messaging app. Managing all of these different messaging things. I'll keep it out of my windows. Turn it back on. That's that. Um, I am going to get my head into my campaign pitch now, I think. Um, week two for the crowdfunding for change course has begun. I've got an email with um, worksheets and things to do around storytelling. Kind of think maybe I should do, do all that first um, since I'm trying to write my story. Yeah, I should. I'm just worried that I, that's not a form of procrastination and I just know I should just do it and get it done. But um, who knows, maybe reading that will help me organize my thoughts better and make it easier to write, so maybe I should just do the, the coursework that I paid for. Um, what else is happening is, um, Carmen is, so it's Leonardo's birthday in like two weeks, um, on the 21st, and so Carmen is coming back from Denmark, where she's now, to be with us for that, and then that's a Saturday, and then on the Monday or Tuesday, we're going to go for a... Um, car camping trip up to the highlands in Scotland, which we can't afford at the moment because we do have almost literally no money, um, and and I'm trying to get things done, so it's like everything, <laughs> all of the sensible options are we probably shouldn't do it, and that's going to be hard work because you know, Carmen's actually sick as well, she has um, stool disorder and is meant to be dead her entire life, since 14 or so, but um, I survived, but has been on cortisone her whole life. Cortisone, cortisone, cortisone. Um, and so she struggles physically and is in constant pain. But very, very, very capable for someone who's in constant like excruciating pain. Um, just the point is, is she's sick? Vanessa's still obviously sick. CFS, I mean, um, and you know, there's a kid, so it's one of those trips where <laughs> there's the four of us in a car and just. 
unfortunately I see a lot of the work side of it because I'll be pitching the tent because because we've got no money we will be trying to camp and can't want to sleep in the car because that's how she travels she's a professional traveler professional vagrant basically um, she has spent decades traveling the world like this and living very very cheap and is very good at it and loves doing it I can do it and I can tolerate anything but I prefer comfort but at the moment we have no money so we're doing things as cheaply as possible so we'll be like borrowing camping equipment and stay in the cheapest camping accommodation we can find um which means it'll be like yeah airbeds at the side of the road it's more quiet because we're not allowed to do that but if we can we will so um we're doing it because carmen is in europe and not traveling and so she wants to do things attach it is if she's not doing something then she'll fly off and go somewhere else and do it so um, she wants to do it. Um, I've never been to Scotland. Vanessa's never really been to Scotland either. So we're here. We're running out of opportunity to do these sorts of travels. And Leonardo's in school. We won't have the availabilities. Um, and because we've run out of money, we came here hoping to do lots of trips, but the money's just died. And so the whole time we've been in England so far, aside from flying to Toronto and Kiev for RaxCon and MissInfoCon. I basically almost not left the house, so I've been going to the back shops to get some snacks and things like that because we have no money to do anything. Um, and catching the train into London costs you know, at least six, seventeen pounds, um, plus all the other expenses that add up on top of that, just incidentally because I'm thirsty or hungry or whatever. So you can buy food in town. Um, so we're so like low on money that we're just doing nothing, I'm not travelling, I'm not even visiting friends in England. I was hope I was fully planned and I actually wasted seventy something pounds on a harness. I wanted to go get back into rock climbing and rock climb every week, twice a week. So I wanted to take Leonardo to gymnastics. I'm not doing any of it because of money. Um but this camping trip ends up being like if we're not going to do anything else, we should do something. And this is the most cost effective traveling we can do. Carmen's with us, so it disperses the cost a little bit. We rent a car, which is surprisingly cheap for, for 10 days. Um, and that's the biggest expense. Fuel, you know, there's a bit of an expense there, but England's not that big. We're not driving that much. Um, accommodation ends up being the biggest expense, even though we're camping. It's like £20 per person per night in some places. Or is it £20 per night, maybe? In total, I don't know, it's like surprisingly expensive to camp in England, but still much cheaper than paying for um, cabins or actual houses. Um, just remind me, I should reach out to friends that live on route and see if we can stay with them. Um, so, yeah, so we've just sort of thrown all caution on the wind and gone, fuck it, we're going to spend more money than we have available to get us through the rest of our time here. If we've got money left, we have to, otherwise, we have nothing. I don't have an income, so you have to like, you know, does a thousand pounds last a month and how much can you spend per week? That sort of thing. And so we're going to overspend now and have to figure out how to make um, ends meet otherwise. We have to sell some crypto at the bottom and risk liquidation even further. Um, slash, you know, more money on the credit card and hopefully that buys us over until I reach the next point where I can sell it. Um, but go on this trip. Uh, in the middle of having no money and having a lot on my plate because then at least we've done something while we're here I've seen some more of England lived a little bit because you don't live while you can then you're wasting your life and then um, it's only a week get to see Scotland, get to see some Ireland we might do some things and then we come back so that's um, anyway that's the 23rdish of July we'll go do that um, so between here and there, I've got to get everything prepared for crowdfunding so that I launch it like two days after we get back. That's the plan. Um, it's a pretty good plan. And so we launched that on the 31st of July or the 1st of August, something like that. Probably the 1st of August. And then it runs for a month. And then at the end of that, it'll be my birthday. So we can make it so that it looks the last day is literally my birthday. Hooray. That's probably pretty clever, actually. And then hopefully in September I will have um, 
at least 20,000 Australian dollars for the project. Um, and I'll be able to pay back some of my expenses, which um, I will definitely be doing, having paid for airline flights to Toronto and Kiev and accommodation. Um, and that should, um, so yeah, fair finances last at least until, well, September's not even enough because it, the, the crowdfunding campaign will end then, but there'll be some delay of getting all the money and um, putting the bank account, I'm sure. Um, and that's assuming that it goes well. I'm confident it will. So we've got a huge network and stuff, but can't assume anything. Um, that's life. That's me for now, and this is a very slow, meandering, personal one today. And it's time for me to get back to working on the crowdfunding so that I have some prospect of continuing to survive for the next few months so that I can get more money to survive for the next year or two while building something that will never make money. Because why not? Bye.